What's up, what's up, uh, community builders? Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Sharath, and today I'm back with yet another episode of Community Decoded Podcast. Today I have uh, Director of Community at Sauce Labs, Jason Baum. Welcome to the show. How are you feeling today? Thanks so much for having me. I feel, uh, feel great today. How's, how's the weather in New Jersey? Oh, weather in New Jersey is I can see the sky again. Oh, <laughs> the, man. The, Clouds are clouds are out, which is a, are a wonderful sign. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, sorry for for the whole uh, Canada mishap. I think Canada screwed the whole East Coast, I guess, in a way. And... Yeah, as my daughter said, I can see birds. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it's so strange the things that like you normally are just so used to seeing, and then when it disappeared, you couldn't see in front of your like face, let alone, you know, the sky, it just kind of disappeared. And we were basically right. calling it looks like Mars smells like cigars for the past <laughs> <laughs> few days. That's a great tweet, by the way. Uh, but I don't know if it's relevant as of now. But uh, no, that's great to hear. Good that weather's back so that you can, you know, have a pleasant full summer in Jersey and New York. But uh, for folks who are listening, let me give you guys like a brief intro of Jason. Jason is the director of community at Sauce Labs, and he previously worked at DevOps Institute in, in as part of the community building there. Uh, and he's like just like me, he's also like a podcaster. So I feel so comfortable talking to you, Jason, because I don't have to like you know hide anything. We we podcasters we know how these things go. So I hope this this becomes more of like a rally. And you, you, you did one show on the AI uh, theme and you're doing one for, I think, uh, Sauce Labs and whatnot. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. And fun fact about Jason, he worked at a TV network before and he's a voice actor. So <laughs> I want to know, like, where did your voice ended up in which movies or which shows and whatnot? But yeah, that's, that's a brief intro of Jason. I'm excited to dive into the conversation. I feel... I feel probably you're the you're one of the first few guests we invited to talk about uh, predominantly about dev communities, which I'm excited to unpack, uncover. But yeah, right off the bat, talk to me about SaaS Labs. What do you guys do? And explain like briefly about you know uh, the whole platform and the community you're building there. Yeah, sure. I mean, SaaS Labs itself is a very complex product, but I can simply sum it up by saying that we are um, in in think of uh, DevOps or software release, uh, you know, it used to be that you would, and, and in some cases, some companies still do this, either you really on certain cadences. So you go through your sprints and then you test. Um, but over time, you know, the theory and DevOps per, um, theory says that if you are testing at every stage that you can have continuous integration, continuous delivery and, and release great products at a faster speed. And, mm -hmm. and so continuous testing came out of that. And so Sauce Labs is a platform that allows you to do testing for whatever phase you're in. Um, we have all different types of testing, whether it's cross-browser testing um, uh, for uh, automating your testing, manual testing, you name mm -hmm. it, you could test your product with us. We do mobile testing. We even do vision, uh, video, uh, visual testing. We, we do it all. So that's right. what Sauce Labs is in a nutshell. Um, mm. And then the community itself, uh, you know, we, we, are, we don't consider ourselves to have our own community, like the Sauce Labs community. What we mm. are is really tapping into a community of testers that is a thriving community. It's a big community of mm. whether it's QA, SDETs, or developers um, who are actively engaged in testing on a day-to-day -day basis for their companies. And therefore, they're very interested in, in open source projects like the Selenium project, Appium project, WebDriver.io that mm. help to make the process uh, easier, smoother, faster. I love that. I think, yeah, so these dev tools, they always are complex, at least for people like me who doesn't really get uh, the whole coding side and whatnot, but I feel you guys bring a lot of ton of value for, for, the, for the folks who code and, you know, make things easy for them. Uh, one thing I really found interesting on Sauce Labs website, but when I go to, when I went to your community page, you said 
you are a community of finders and fixers. I love yeah. that. I love it so much. <laughs> I might steal it and probably like use it somewhere. It's so uh, it's so well defined, right? The the whole fixers, which are like testers, you know, and even the finders, they they, they kind of try to find the bugs and whatnot and bring the make the product better. So uh, I love that, and I love the fact that you're not only like you know building a community for your customers, but just in general, lifting the whole testing industry. So curious question, how did you start? What was like the inception of uh, SaaS Labs, the community you're building? Yeah, it's an interesting project because I came in um, in, in, a, in this phase or time of SaaS Labs where there was no community function. Mm. Um, the community team was really part of our tech docs team. The team right. sort of split. And there was this like waiting period. I, I don't really know how to describe it except to say that it, it needed someone to come in and charge the program forward, really. And I started at Sauce Labs because it was because of its open source roots. So mm -hmm. Sauce Labs was born from the open source project, from the um, mm -hmm. open source Selenium project. Mm -hmm. um, and our, our co founder founded the Selenium project, founded Appium. And that to me was really inspiring because I, a I had never worked for um, an open source pro project mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I never was able to really. I haven't. This is like one area of community that I haven't had a chance to really dive into deeper. Um, I was sort of in ed tech at DevOps Institute. Knew a lot of developers. Was mm -hmm. becoming very familiar with DevOps principles. But I just wasn't on that other side of, of it, you know, from a, from a product standpoint. So this was really cool, a cool opportunity. When I got here, I, I realized Sauce Labs was really good at talking to enterprise companies. Mm -hmm. What Sauce Labs was not doing a, a great enough job of was talking to the practitioners themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was... Yeah. And that was what I saw a huge opportunity to get back to our roots because that's what we were known for. And, and so the first step that finders and fixers, I'm so glad that you kind of honed in on that because that was our first challenge, right? When you, when you start a community, because really we were starting our approach to community from scratch. And, and the first thing you got to do is who, who is this community? Who, who are the members going to be, right? I mean, this Absolutely. community building 101, who are they? What are their problems? Or what are their hopes, their dreams, their inspirations, their aspirations? You know, all these, their, what keeps them up at night? All those things we needed to find out. And then mm -hmm. we needed to create content that would deliver that value to them. And mm -hmm. as long as we fit that, you know, those three things, I felt mm. like we would be successful. And we just kind of accelerated, accelerated, accelerated to what took off. And that mm. finders and fixers came out of like one of our first meetings together as a team where I was basically like, okay, we, who, who are our members? And we were like, wrote down all these QAs, SDETs, right. developers, you, you know what I mean? Are you get traditional testers, non-traditional. I mean, you could go on and on for right. who is testing. Right. And that's an area of, uh, of that was a, a good thing and a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And with the shift left movement, um, so many people were being left out. Uh, you know, QAs are being unemployed. That's not really mm -hmm. an interest for companies anymore. Um, mm -hmm. More was being put on S debts and developers to test. And they didn't really have that experience. They could write the code, they couldn't write the test. And so right. that's there's this skill gap. Right. right. And so that's why we are just like, we're not going to call them by their title. We're going to mm. call them by their functionality. Are you mm. finding and are you fixing? You mm. belong. And mm. as simple as that. Right. I love that because I think the, uh, there is a clear intention, right? Like whenever, whoever, if I'm a tester and I find it fascinating to see the fact that you're bringing a bunch of people who do justice to their job, right? And it's not tied to your role. You're basically like more than bigger than your role. I think that bigger than your persona is what I felt like, okay, this is so cool. I, I don't know if you named your community finders and fixers, but you should like. We it's, should, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's basically instead of branding Sauce Labs community, which is, I think, you know, 
pretty uh, just as, just my two cents now that we're kind of uh, getting into <laughs> brainstorming but i would i would go ahead and fi- and buy findersandfixers.com like straight away it's a great yeah. idea yeah yeah especially right? like, after this it, podcast comes out <laughs> exactly so that you 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 kind of brand in with that you know persona and i love that you know what we ended up uh, naming the community but now you know and, and it's funny cuz none of us on the community team actually like the name <laughs> but what actually happened was we we decided to put it out to the uh mm. community and mm. build the community with the community itself right. and so we put out a bunch of names and we did some fun internal naming things and then we did it right. externally and it was like one of my favorite ones was like my sauce brings all the boys to the yard or like some other <laughs> stuff that was really funny that of course we're like, okay, well, we're not going to name the community that, but, um, right. and it, it ended up becoming sauce squad, uh, oh. became the name. And there's, con- there's some conflict here because some of us are like, we absolutely hate that name, but <laughs> I, I'm thinking maybe we might need to do a renaming, uh, Sauce or something like that. What is good? I think it goes good on a t-shirt, right? <laughs> it does, and it I am does. very much about my t-shirts and swag. So, right, yeah, <laughs> it, it makes a good swag for sure. Community sure. is all about like you know, uh, swag. At least majority percentage of you know interacting with people. But mm-hmm. so you you did mention uh, about your co-founder building products for certain people like developers, testers, and whatnot. It's such a vast uh, industry, like QA as in general, right? There is, like you said, typical traditional industry. I used to work at corporate companies where we had probably 300 testers mm-hmm. for for a single project. It's, it's, it's a big industry. If there is a comparison between number of testers versus number of developers in a team, testers will all the time. And... How did you uh, really cover that much of a ground? Is that was that like your what moves did you made when you launched this community? Because it's not a customer based community, like you said. Sauslops enterprise customers are not part of it, probably part of it. But how did you manage such you know handling such a big thing? And what was your uh, moves? Okay, come comms or is there a landing page or what? What? how did you approach them? That's a, it's a good question. And, you know, one of the first things that I said was, boy, we could really boil the ocean with Mm. this. And Mm. I think that's a problem that many, many, many people in community find themselves in where Mm. it's like, we have so many ideas and dreams Mm. and plans for how we want to grow and build the community that we're not like focused on Let's do little things. Let's, right. you know, the minimal viable communities. Let's let's try things out. Let's do some in-person events. Let's partner. Right. Um, so what we did was the first thing um, was that we focused on content mm-hmm. because content in long form, short form, we went by slash data reports and we we're like, okay, slash data is saying, you know, Twitch is becoming more and more and more popular as long form mm. content for de- um, developer education, mm. uh, LinkedIn certainly, and Twitter. And that's where we focused quite a bit of our content and, and YouTube. Mm. And we developed a couple of shows mm. and that was really our first um, first way of kind of expanding our reach so that we mm-hmm. could reach more people outside of just who made up our customer base, because while mm-hmm. our customer base is fantastic and we do need to engage them more, um, mm-hmm. I was really looking at the opportunity that we had to get our name out there and position ourselves a bit differently. Talking mm-hmm. about how sauce labs is today, rather than maybe what some people re- think of sauce lab or thought of sauce labs for the past, maybe like five years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and also just, talking about these basic principles that the community was begging for. So many people were begging for educational content. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I focused our dev advocates on was just content, content, content. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we, we have a, a, we had a Twitch stream. um, We had a a YouTube show called uh, test, uh, test automation experience. We have a podcast called tech, 
uh, test case scenario. And, um, you know, that's where so much of our, our time was spent. And then in addition to that, we started up something called the fellowship program, the open source fellowship program. Nice. And for the open source fellowship program, we brought in five fellows who, um, we wanted to make sure that we were covering, um, all of our bases and something that's really passionate about for all of our team is diversity and inclusion and open source. Right. And so we made sure that we had a diverse group of fellows and they right. spent their time working on a project that we had um, taken on three years ago and didn't really do much with called Elemental Selenium. Mm. And basically what that is, is just more of like you sign up and you get a Selenium tip in your inbox. Mm -hmm. Um, and you get that over and over, like for every week you get a new tip. Mm -hmm. And so we open source that it's now, you can submit your own tips. Now you can upload mm -hmm. videos, you can join a community there and we're going to be growing that. That's still a work in progress, but I love mm -hmm. working on communities with community participation. And sometimes, you know, we, you don't always need a finished product. Right. Um, for years I got stuck on, it needs to be perfect when you release Mm, and course, over time yeah. I have learned that that's not the case. You mm. know, you, you put out your minimal viable product and then you iterate and improve yeah. and then you improve with feedback. And, and honestly, yeah. that is community, right? That's how you build with community. Right. And no, I think I couldn't like stress on that concept of iteration. I think the mindset, uh, we have to, we have to think like product people. Like even though we're building community, because like you said, when you build a community by default, you want to target big, you know, chunks of people. Like it's not 10%, even like hundred, like it, it's definitely bigger than what you expect. But when you execute, you can really like, you know, cover the whole ground. That's why I was very curious. How did, what was your approach of, you know, entering into the market? and getting that attention because I think you made a great move of honing on the content side, because I think that's, that's how we live and breathe right now as we, you know, go through the social era of different, different platforms. And so talk to me about one thing. Uh, you talked about community participation, right? And I like the way you said you build community through community participation. One of my biggest uh, questions for this podcast. And again, I'm not judging the, the book by the cover, but generally speaking, all the developers, most of the testers are not social, right? <laughs> they're, they're very, they're very much they're into their own zone. They code, they get the shit done. They move on. What did you do to make them come out of their comfort zone to participate and engage with others? I think that's actually, um, you know, before I really started working with developers and developer communities, that's how we portray developers, right? That's the, um, that's the stigma that exists about developers. They're like coding in their room, in a dark room by themselves. I actually find developers to be extremely social. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've built communities for so many industries over my 17 right. years of building communities, you know, for bankers, CFOs, arts and crafts, retailers, <laughs> manufacturers. Right. I mean, like all ed tech, my, my experience with developers is that it's actually very easy to get developers to talk and share. Um, you need to give them a platform, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is, again, you need to give them the space access, right? Um, and you'd be surprised. We, we partnered with a lot of, um, cause next on our roadmap is meetups and I got my start in community and meetups, building mm -hmm. chapters of associations and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's heavy, that's heavy lifting, right? That's a lot mm -hmm. of work, especially when you build them all over the world. And I mean, that's, it's a ton of effort. Right. Um, as you're scaling, what I tried to do is partner. And so I partnered with, so far we've partnered with like Gitpod. We've partnered with the Node.js community. We're going to be partnering with the, like 
doing things with like Vue.js. So we are doing things with other communities and you'd be surprised they're extremely social, extremely active communities. And mm -hmm. as we bring out people from our own, we're finding the same thing. They're actually mm -hmm. very social. They want to interact. They're <laughs> passionate about their frameworks. They're passionate about the languages that they use to code. They're passionate. I mean, they will debate Java mm -hmm. versus Python. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> so, it's so great to see because they're right. very thriving communities in my opinion. Right. No, no. Yeah. True. True. I think I do see that point because they're very passionate because they have, they're building stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and they have something to share in, mm -hmm. uh, I feel, uh, but again, completely, you know, uh, maybe I'm more of like looking from the, from a bird's eye view. So question on, you mentioned a couple of times in this conversation, we we're like 20 minutes down and you said many times about partners and what are some tactics that you want to share uh, when you, when community builders listening about going for partnerships is what do you offer? Like, how do you go from zero to one hmm. in that whole life cycle? Okay. I, I want to like partner with some X. What is something that I offer? Is it a proposal or talk to me about like the semantics in, in everything that you went through? Uh, I don't want to make it sound so easy, but sometimes it's as simple as getting in someone's DMS and being like, Hey, love what the community is doing. We should totally partner on something cool. Yeah. Let's do it. When should we do it? And just honestly, like anything, you just got to ask. And then what's the worst thing that's going to happen? They say, no. Okay, fine. We'll move on to the next community. Next person. It, it might be hard finding who to reach out to, but thanks to tools like, I mean, we have LinkedIn, we have Twitter, everybody's right. got yep. <laughs> their social out there somewhere, especially community people are usually yep. more active, uh, than others. Um, and yeah, it just comes down to an ask. Mm -hmm. And I find that community builders have been so gracious and willing to help, uh, each other. I have never encountered someone in the, in the world of community who's like, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even if they can't take it on right now, it's, I can't take it on right now, but sounds great in the future. And I've mm -hmm. had that interaction and then actually mm -hmm. plan something in the future. Cause I'll follow up. So mm -hmm. it's just a little bit of persistence, the willingness to ask and, um, let people surprise you. Uh, and, and then we always have swag on hand or anything mm -hmm. to say, thank you. And even when we had partners, you know, they'll send us swag. So I think it's just a wonderful thing to be able to combine and do some partnerships. Plus it is a way to grow your own community. Um, you know, you, you graft a little bit right from each mm -hmm. other's communities and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Cause at yeah, the end of the day, they're getting value. Right. Yeah. And with value visibility and basically they're also kind of expanding their network, right? Mm -hmm. They tap into your community so that your community networks are uh, part of their uh, ecosystem. So quick, let's change it gears a little bit and I want to talk about the media presence. You're a podcaster, you worked in somewhat like, you know, uh, in a TV network, so you get it. And given we are, the whole world is actually going towards media presence. Every, pretty much every B2B, B2C, you name it, D2C brands, everybody has a social media presence, right? Not just social media, but YouTube channels and whatnot. How do you think and how, what, how do you envision about media being a, may, playing a major role in community building? It's interesting because I've seen arguments about this and especially mm -hmm. the, the way that I have handled my community, I've seen arguments against or, or saying that it's not community because mm. the difference between a member and a subscriber, right? Mm. Um, and to that, I would counter who cares. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it honestly has never bothered me. The fact right. that we're maybe building a following and maybe not in the traditional sense of a community, because at the end of the day, you know, that's what I was doing when you mentioned television, you know, I, I was in development for a short period of time and television mm -hmm. worked on 
um, uh, worked at uh, MTV networks for a few different networks there. And it's building stuff that people want to engage with and want to get value from and become passionate about. And, but I mean, does it sound familiar to you? Because that is to me community building. Mm -hmm. And even when I started in, in what would be my career, I wanted to go into radio. You know, I had a show in, in college and so I was doing this and it felt good. It felt natural. I loved it and I hated it at the same time because radio <laughs> at that time was not what I imagined it would be. I grew up on Opie and Anthony and Howard Stern and I wanted mm. a talk radio show and that's what I wanted. And mm -hmm. that was not what radio was becoming. And radio right. then died <laughs> shortly after. And then it became podcasting. So now I get to do what I wanted to do. Um, and it's building an audience, sure. But I think if you can engage your audience, you can bring your audience into the show. And so as you do more, as you bring, as you bring more value to them, as you get more passionate listeners or followers, then you can have them contribute to the show. Ask them to ask a question. Hey, do you have anything that you want to ask us? Or what's the top five things that you learned from today's episode that you think we should cover in future episodes? There's so many, you can create a Patreon account and, and engage them in that way. You special episodes just for your, you know, your VIP listeners. So even those are communities and, um, I guess it's a different way to think about community, but at the end of the day, I think it's all the same. Absolutely. I think there is slight difference between, I would say, audience building versus community building. But like you said, you know, it's, if you go to details, everything is different. Like, you know, we can really make a big list of all the, all the differences between many things, but but, there, but like you said, if you interact, create content and someone is responding to you, that means there is a slight opportunity that you're creating, right? That all That is all that matters. Everything else, how you do it, you know, it's all like, you know, it fades away eventually. Like 10 years down the line, you have, you've started all creating content and gathering audience, but you become community. Who cares? Like, you know. It's all, exactly. part of the, it's all part of the game. Uh, that's, that's a great way of looking at media. And think not about Star it. Trek. Oh, right. you know, they are very well known for having an extremely passionate community mm. of Trekkies. Right. Right. I, I think it is possible for media to, to, I guess, be in that community bubble because it is a way to engage an audience, engage a crowd, connect them on a like-minded, passionate, you know, a like-minded subject matter that they're passionate about. And I mean, that to me is community. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, take, take artists, for example, take Taylor Swift. She doesn't have like a Slack channel <laughs> yeah. or like a Slack workspace of her billion people you know, fans, right? But she has a community, right? If she's going through something, there are people supporting her, you know, encouraging her and whatnot. So I feel not getting into details is much more important when you play the long game. F you know, fun details. fact about me, <laughs> this is, I'm going to share something I've never shared publicly. Yeah. Uh, when I was in, in uh, my freshman year of high school, or, or I guess it was uh, middle school, what was it? Yeah, high school, I was very active in a band's forums and so active that I eventually became a moderator of the forums and got more wow. involved and more involved. And so I was kind of community building back then that was mm. for a band, right? right? So yeah, bands absolutely have communities. Yeah, absolutely. I think everything we do, if we are doing it, if we, any work that is going out of these four walls that involves others, there is a community. Mm -hmm. How do you name it? How do you define it? How do you measure it? That's all like, you know, it depends stage by stage, but that's great. I, I'm curious, what bands did you like moderate? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> this is the part I'm better. It was, uh, it was Weezer. 
Um, okay. But back then, Weezer was a little bit different <laughs> of a band, but that was a very long time ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Now that we're talking about your alter personas, like the band, band moderator and all that, where did you, your voice ended up as a, as a voice actor? I mean, not many places, but like I, I was, I was, did a lot of work with some people on, on, um, some sketch comedy shows and nice. um i did a, a fake trailer for a new um uh, american pie that had been coming out for someone <laughs> i did um, a walking tour of new york i did an audio book wow. i did uh a whole bunch of stuff like that nice. um, got to read for a mcdonald's commercial didn't get it but <laughs> got to read for it uh, and some other work so it was like more more smaller work for vo vo um but uh, yeah, I, awesome. I, I loved it. It was just another way to do this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think your everything counts, right? Like all these those experiences are adding up to you as a podcaster right now. Yeah. So let's switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about one of the interesting things. I find it fascinating when it, whenever I research on dev communities is that. I don't know, for some reason, there is this big camaraderie among developers, right? This, there is this brotherhood, there is this togetherness that they want to help each other for whatever, stack, stack overflow. I see more uh, brotherhood there than any, any place else, right? Like some of these Reddit channels, they're like, especially developer channels, they're like, wow, they help, they want to help and they want to like come out, go extra mile and whatnot. So question to you is that how do you manage keeping up that spirit at Sauce mm -hmm. Labs? What do you what do you what what kind of values that you kind of embody and repeat to the team and to the community over and over again to keep up that high spirit? That's a hard question. I think it just comes down to modeling, right? It's the behavior we want modeled back to us. Uh, you know, we we model it and then they model it back to us. Um, by putting on really engaging, fun, um, events by participating in events that share, um, our values, our beliefs, um, are a little more fun. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's how we do it. I mean, like, again, a lot of what we are doing right now is through content. And mm -hmm. so it's having fun on our podcast, for example, you know, we, mm -hmm. The, the podcast that we do, I didn't want to do a typical Q and a one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. I think that I, I have done those shows and I love those shows. The panel was a different format. I just wanted to try something new and we brought on experts, um, who, you know, our own de developer advocates or, um, or internal, you know, experts. And it's just a chat. It's just an, you know, a 37 minute long, 45 minute long conversation about topics we love and we have fun, we laugh and we make it interesting. And I think that's so hard for some concepts in tech, right? To make interesting, like continuous testing, like, okay, we know the value of it, right? So when Ticketmaster goes down and everybody can't get their Taylor Swift tickets, <laughs> That was a like that's sometimes that's a testing issue, you know, right. but how, but, but we don't think of it in those terms and we don't talk right. about it in those terms, but we can, and then we can also put, make, have fun doing it, you know, make each other laugh. And right. I think sometimes just having, being able to put a smile on, having a sense of humor in business is a good thing that so many people are afraid of. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess my recommendation to other businesses is relax, have fun, smile, laugh. People connect to you more because you're more down to earth. You're not selling something to them. You're just joining them in their conversation where they are. Hmm. I, yeah, that's something I learned, you know, over the years as well. Podcasts become better when they are conversations, you know, and People really, so I think this is something I learned from Joe Rogan, right? Pretty, pretty big podcaster. He never follows like a pattern. Every episode is different. Every episode is because it's every conversation, just like every conversation is different. Every guest brings something to the table and he hones on that more than anything else. 
than a piece of paper with a bunch of questions, which cleverly he unpacks as well, right? Like take Tim Ferriss, man, that guy is like a monster. I love listening to him because he really like orchestrates the conversation in a way that the listeners stick to it, right? That's something as a podcasters, like, you know, we, we, we try to either copy, steal and like replicate it. So in your experience, now that we're talking about podcast, uh, how do you like view that, that medium hmm. into community building? Like, you know, how do you blend both of them? It can be strategy. You take the lead, but I'm just like, you know, curious about that. Um, yeah. So podcasting, I think is like how we were talking about media, you know, you're, I do think of it as building a show mm -hmm. and I do think of it as I'm going to build an audience from that show. And from that audience, I'm going to create people, you know, I'm going to create a passionate base who wants to tune in and wants to hear mm -hmm. more from us. And the more that we have that, the better, because first of all, we're going to be authentic. We're not going to change who we are. We're going to be, you know, we're very honest. We are down to earth and we are ourselves and we have fun conversations. We have serious conversations. We dive into topics that may be very technical. Sometimes we're completely not technical and we'll talk about people moving. We'll talk about people's accents from wherever they are. We'll talk about, you know, whatever it is, uh, wherever, like you said, it's kind of where, wherever the, the show that day takes us. And to me as a listener, I find that exciting. Um, there is a place for extremely produced podcasts. I, mm. you know, we're not one of them and that's not my style because that's right. just not how I think. And that's not how I direct myself. And mm -hmm. so therefore I can't do that. That's not me. And mm -hmm. I think part of creating a podcast, right. Is, is knowing yourself and knowing what you're good at, like anything. And just double down, double down on that. And mm. that's the direction that we took with the podcast. Um, and I take to other podcasts too. I, everywhere I go, I think I put my, I try to put my stamp on it. This is mm. going to be me. I'm, it's going to be, I, I'm not changing who I am. I'm not mm. changing how I speak. And I'm going to speak directly to you, the listener. I am going to just give you everything that I have. And hopefully you enjoy it. And if you don't, that's okay. Like not everybody has to listen to the same thing. There are so many podcasts out there. And I think what makes them stand out are the ones that are authentic, that are a little different. We are all as human beings, extremely different people. So, you know, it's just like when you go to meet someone, sometimes you hit it off and it's a great, great relationship. Other times you're like, this is probably someone I'm never going to talk to again. And that's okay with me, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just, it's the same process. I think you can't really please everybody, right? When, nah. when you're building an audience or a community, there are, there are some cases where you just can't see eye to eye with some set of people. And that's okay. Like, you know, I always believe in this notion, always serve the people who seek you mm -hmm. and, literally ignore the people who are against you right that that, that is that is much better you know it's in a way so that... funny i used to have such a hard time with that earlier on, earlier on in my like community career i i don't know it, almost 20 years is a long time to do anything and mm -hmm. i love this industry like i came in, into it by accident but i early on it's very hard i think to understand that as building a community, you're building it for a certain group of people. Now, while those people may be diverse, it's right. still around the same sort of common, something's going to bring them together. Right. But by doing that, you're sort of excluding another group. Right. And I had a hard time because I didn't want to be exclusive. That word is disgusting to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. But at the same time, Communities kind of have to be a little bit of that, right. not by putting up walls and saying, stay out. Obviously those exist, but, and that's not what we're looking to do, but in an, not in an elitist way, but in reality, when you create a community, you kind of are creating a little bit of exclusion there. Um, and I think that's okay because we should all have our pockets where we go and that's our, 
our our hot pocket. That's our good place to go. You know, that's what makes us feel good, our safe space. Right. And, uh, you know, I think that's important to understand the difference, you know, right. um, when you're building a community that you are not like creating this exclusive place. I don't know. Maybe that's, I, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit on that topic, but I, it was just no, hard no, for me to understand. No, you're right. I think it, it, it so the way I think is, it's not you're being exclusive. Uh, I would flip the switch and think about, I get a chance to meet like-minded people. And that's it. That's the end of that sentence. You know, I, I, I'm not thinking about the other group. Once you have that other set of people coming to your mind, you have this weird like comparisons or like, you know, uh, insecurities that you you kind of entertain, which deviates the focus focus on the set of group you want to focus, and so that's why I made my mind like even when I create content on Twitter, right? I I tweet a lot, and I sometimes get this backlash from people saying, "Hey, that opinion is shitty," and quietly I tell to them, "Then don't." see my tweet <laughs> just like you know scroll through there are like tons of tweets that you can see right and some people they just double down support they just go one extra mile they slide into my dms and say wow that's a great opinion i feel the same way they retweet and all that good that set of people is what i want right so it 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 is it is for your own peace <laughs> and even when you build community the thing i really uh kind of try to balance is that if there is some person who doesn't ag agree it's better to like ask them politely to either leave or like find the people who they align with that's find simple. your community exactly yes. that's it this is not yep. yours right. just like i'm not part of you know some other you can't really be part of every community right then you know you'll exhaust yourself so uh, but yeah, great point that you mentioned that that's, that's a struggle. It's, it's an ongoing struggle that a lot of people go through on a day-to-day -day basis because it's, it's, it's there. You can't really like, you know, eliminate the other set. So it's, it's also interesting with industries, right. And building community for a product, mm -hmm. right. You're competing against mm -hmm. other products or companies, right. right? In your space. Right. But from a community perspective, you can't look at it that way, mm. you know, at, at least in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. And sure. this is a little bit of my like nonprofit association background. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it's very important that competitors mm -hmm. participate in their communities together. Mm. In some sense, that's why open source is so beautiful because sure. competitors have to play nice. Right. Uh, because they need to keep the lights on right. and they need these projects to exist. Right. And so I think it's really important and, and something that I, I try to emphasize as much as I can, you know, there's that saying the rising tide lifts all boats. And mm -hmm. I think that's such an important phrase to constantly have in our minds as we are building mm -hmm. these communities in business and product, we need the industry to survive. And to right. do that, we need to be in this community together. We are all in this community. This is not ours. This is not theirs. This is ours. And how can we all contribute and improve and grow it? I think the uh, the piece that I want to add on top of what you said is, as a community builder, you basically have to for completely forget and remove personal intentions, period when you want to do something for others, it should be a universal intention that you put it outside. That's why I, I see competition as, as a positive way that, that makes us better. Same the way we challenge them to make something better that comes out of them, right? Whoever it is, right? Not just products, but just in general people, right? Create, creators compete with each other. Athletes compete with each other. So one person doing something will challenge the other person they do something so i treat it that way and personal intentions are are the worst if you're as a listener whoever it is like listening if you have a personal intention to grow your business which is good not not, not saying that it's bad but there should be a higher purpose in it, 
the thing you're building is bigger than yourself individually so once you have that once you practice that notion i feel that's why i really admire developer communities is because they don't have ego that's fascinating to me even though they're builders they're building something from scratch from nowhere they're bringing this idea this by coding they have that egoless personality that they want to help other developers to build quality code or build quality products right it takes that's why when i so i i come from a developer not a developer but a, a it background because my parents forced me to like you know take it in my college uh, i i used to like code and when i go to like stack overflow this was like 10 10 years ago man those folks are for one single question there will be like 10 different approaches to to solve that single problem that is super fascinating to me right because they're going above and beyond and to share their thinking their execution with others which is kind of an ip right so the egoless uh intention is i feel you know it's really important and i feel developers have that by nature you know at least definitely and and that goes back to your question about getting them to engage you don't have to push them they want to yeah. they want to help they want to figure out um these problems together um solve these problems uh you know at, at their core developers are builders and you can't build something by yourself mm. uh you need the help of someone or you need the help of a community right it right. it's kind of like that saying about raising a child you know you need you need a need a village, a, a village. Yeah. It, it's that same concept and and i i think that's what's so beautiful about developers and developer mm-hmm. communities and that's something why i guess i i find myself now you know at the helm of 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 creating something for developer communities because it's just i didn't realize how much i would love it mm mm-hmm. you know a, a building for so many different industries a, and i can't see myself you know my career has been all over the place like we right. kind of went went through i i think i'm at my happiest in building communities right now for a developer community and if you want to elaborate on that no on that notion right like on your belief what would you do something differently you know from the past like go back to like 10 year old or like you know 10 year old oh gosh we're really going no, no, back when i say 10 not <laughs> not 10 year old but 10 years, years in my old. career yeah 10 years yeah. go back to that so i so one fun thing i always treat i don't treat my age as my actual age so i i quantify in a way that when i started something that's my age <laughs> interesting so i started my startups journey like 4 years ago so i am actually 4 years 4 years old in that perspective but yeah so what would you do like that's something... really cool i have never heard that by the way i that's yeah, so fantastic yeah so the reason is you you lower a lot of expectations if you i'm a i'm 33 33 year old right and other 33 year olds who are in startups man if they spend 20 years in startups that they have so much upper hand than me of course because i just literally i'm a baby so that gives me that learning curve okay i'm a baby if i do a mistake that's fine you know if i screw up something that's fine but anyway going back to that question 10 10 years ago if you were to do something different in communities what would you do in and... here's something that i learned along the way is that i would not be here where i am if i did not go the route that i did no matter where it led to the screw ups the whatever it was that i had to learn over that path it shaped who i am today maybe that's a cop out answer but i i really do actually believe that and if i could change one thing i spent a long time in one place for a period of time i was i was at one place for almost 10 years mm. i would never do that again in my career because i think there are so every time you change your employer or your industry or what industry you're serving as a community professional right i think you grow as an individual 
I had no experience in any of the industries that I <laughs> built communities for. None. Right. right. And yet I became part of the community. I grew to love the people in the community. I still am very active or maintain converse, you know, maintain relationships within those communities. And it helped shape me. It it's it's grown me and what I'm able to do or or you know reference or uh sometimes someone will ask a will bring up a question about the retail industry i'm like oh i know that i spent mm. 10 years in in the retail industry doing communities but still you know i know that industry really well um so maybe that's and, the one thing i would change is not spending nearly as much time in one and you that's a that's a fascinating thing to hear since you're not part of an industry but you started building community what is the secret like when you go there what is your framework looks like is it more from as a student that you go there like versus just just unpack that for me i learn from other people their stories their doing this <laughs> having these conversations i learn through stories and practical application of uh, you know examples and, and that's how I learn and so when I come to a new industry I just dive right in I don't hesitate mm -hmm. I meet as many people as many of the members as I can when I when I got mm -hmm. to sauce labs I had our our um, senior dev advocate who has over a hundred thousand plus people in his following uh, put out to his entire distribution list my calendar link and mm -hmm. said book 15 minutes on my calendar because I really want to talk to you and learn all of your problems your right. what what's going on with you just vent to me tell me what's going on you know teach me the industry like and I got so many calendar, uh, so many people booking on my calendar, right. uh, to the point where I had to like cut it off, but it was great because I right. had just like 15 minute, wonderful deep dives into these people, people's lives. There some deep concerns. People were crying on their wow. zooms with me, like just really just passionate about what they do or not, or just saying, ah, I got into this because I don't know why, you know, like, so it really ran the gamut, and, yeah. but I really learned a lot. And then through our podcast and, and I do a podcast every step of the journey because each industry has some more to say, I think, and podcast is a great format for that. Um, and I learn from other people that way. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, I have like one last question that, yeah. that's kind of like a general, uh, hit, what are a few lessons that you want to pass to community builders who are not building developer communities, but they can learn from developer communities? Well, I guess because I didn't always build developer communities, but I can just share some pearls of wisdom, I guess. I don't know. I, I, I hate saying like I could, I, it's hard for me to admit that I might have something to share. Uh, <laughs> oh, you have well, for sure. I can, I can, I can tell that for sure. Well, I, it's easy to get down on yourself when you're building communities because it's hard. Mm. Community building is hard. Yeah. Um, prioritize, come up with your own roadmap. Don't boil the ocean. Stay mm. singular focused. Achieve the little bits. It's, uh, there's that movie, um, I forget the name, but it's like uh, where they talk about baby steps. Um, mm. What about Bob? Uh, mm. If you've never seen that movie, watch that movie. It's a fantastic, fantastic mm. movie. But anyway, they talk about baby steps. And it's really true. In community, you need to do this through baby steps because mm. otherwise you can sink real quick. Mm. Uh, it's not for everybody. Um, right. I think most of the community builders who I have talked to, especially the ones who have been doing it like me as long as I have, there's like this... <laughs> passion that you can't explain. It's like, you've been doing it your whole life. You've always been sort of in this, in this mode, uh, and it's hard to turn it off and it can be exhausting. You can, you can get mentally exhausted from it pretty mm -hmm. quick. So don't boil the ocean, 
take time off when you need it, get help where you can and have fun. Awesome. I think, I think that's, that's probably the best way to end this episode. Uh, Jason, this has been blast. I actually, I, I didn't expect that we go deep into maybe probably like some philosophical angle, but we did. I'm so glad that I love the conversations that go like, you know, deep and any, any closing thoughts before we, we close it out. Oh, sure. Thanks so much for having me on the show and, and going deep is kind of my specialty. So awesome. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, we should thanks. probably, we should have more conversations then. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, I love doing that. Thanks awesome. so much. I really appreciate the time. No worries. And thanks for all the listeners. We appreciate your attention and time you're giving to us and stay tuned for more of these episodes. That's what, that's what I do. I love to do to bring these conversations and squeeze as much as I can so that you don't have to like, you know, go through some struggles, but thanks for tuning in. Appreciate you all. And uh, that's it. That's a wrap for this episode. Cheers. Hey.